inverse by one position. It's a little hard to understand, but I'll get to this in a little more detail. I'm going to show you a video of this happening. Me entering the combination, which has been changed for purposes of obviousness to one, two, three, and opening the lock. It's one. You can see the first tumbler advances, first tumbler and the second tumbler advance again. The lock opens and the mechanism resets itself. The linkage I'm operating on the left side with my thumb is what would normally be connected to the handle. There's a sort of clutch mechanism that when you depress the handle a certain distance, it applies pressure to the locking bar. If you depress it any further, it rotates the, this mechanism in the opposite direction for setting the lock. So to manipulate this lock, we first have to figure out which of these tumblers is binding. You guys all know how to pick locks, right? I hope so. If you don't, you should learn. But what we're going to be doing is we're going to use this, the same principle as in lock picking to figure out the combination. We're going to use the binding tumblers. One of these tumblers is going to be a bit thicker or a bit out of tolerance compared to the rest. And when we apply force to that locking bar, it's going to cause that one tumbler to not want to budge. And we're going to be able to feel that in the buttons. This is, again, finding which one's binding. The top one is binding. It doesn't want to move. The second, third, fourth, and fifth ones move great. Since the first one is binding, we know from the outside of the lock that that first tumbler is not in the correct position. We don't know what, what position it's supposed to be in, but we know that it's not supposed to be in the zeroth position. So we're going to put it in the first position by pushing the button. And now we're going to check to see if any other tumblers are binding. Because guess what? If we put the tum that first tumbler in the correct position by pushing it once, then a new tumbler would start binding and we would be able to feel that. Unfortunately, a new tumbler isn't binding. So we know that the first tumbler isn't in the zeroth position and isn't in the first position. So we're going to advance it by one position by pressing a throwaway button. This can be any other button that isn't the first button. It's some button we don't know anything about. In this case, I, I used five. I'm going to show you the video again just for the heck of it. I press 5, which advances the first tumbler by 1, and now check for binding in the other tumblers, which we don't see. So we try, try another throwaway button. In this case, I'm going to use the fourth button. And now we discover that the second tumbler has started binding, because the first tumbler is now in the correct position. We reset the lock, and we try, OK. We know that the first tumbler is in the correct position. We know that the second tumbler is not in the correct position. So we're going to try moving the second tumbler by one and the first tumbler by two. We're going to try a, comb a trial combination, one, five, two. This puts the first tumbler in the second position, the fifth tumbler in the first position, and the second tumbler in the first position. And we check to see if any are binding. Nope. So we, we try it. OK. If the second tumbler was in the wrong position, let's put the second tumbler in the second position. We try one, two, five. This puts the first and second tumblers in the correct position, as it so happens. We can tell because we're cheating looking at a, uh, the actual locking components right here. And we see if another tumbler is binding. As it happens, because the first and second tumblers are in the correct position, now the third tumbler is binding. So we try the combination one, two, three to put the first tumbler in the second position, the second tumbler in the first position, and the third tumbler in the, in the zeroth or, second, or first position, sorry. And the lock opens. Bada bing. Takes you about a minute or two once you get good at it. You can do this on any lock in the field. It's a little more complicated if this lock has been set up so that you have to push two numbers at the same time but it's still doable. If you want to learn how to do it, there's a great document that was written a long time ago by a guy called The Hobbit. If you look online, it's all over the web. It's almost incomprehensible if you don't know how the lock works. Fortunately, now you do. So if you Google for simplex Hobbit, you'll probably find it right now. And I'm going to move on to the electronic version of a knowledge-based lock. Traditionally, these have been defeated using UV theft detection powder. Again, because the white point is set a bit low, you can't actually see the powder because it's white. How this works is you dust the powder, you dust the keypad with UV powder. 
You come back the next day after the lock has been opened, and you shine your handy-dandy UV flashlight on the lock, and you see which keys have had the powder rubbed off. And then you come back and try again and again and again each permutation of those keys until the lock opens. This is kind of problematic, because you're going to be sitting there for a week or two. And if the lock locks you out after three or ten incorrect tries, you're probably up shit creek, because it might take a year. So what you can do is use a highlighter. As it turns out, highlighters will be tracked from key to key for just about one step. This was discovered by a couple friends of mine who shall remain anonymous at MIT. You can also use shoulder surfing and hidden cameras. And I'm going to tell you a bit more about the highlighter trick in just a sec. Shoulder surfing, hidden cameras, Johnny Long showed us a great video of this last night, if you were there for the talk. It's absolutely hilarious. Just watch the keypad with a hidden camera. Anyway, about this UV powder trick, the fluorescent powder trick, I mean. If you look at this keypad, this is a perfectly ordinary keypad. In fact, this is the keypad from that, from a sensor I'm going to be showing you a bit later on in this talk. If you look at the number one key, it looks a little bit different. To the left of the number one, you can just see the faintest trace of, trace of a highlighter. If someone doing this in the field were a little worried, but maybe if someone would look at the keypad and say, hey, someone put highlighter on my keypad, they must be trying to break into my system. Well, you graffiti all over the lock, and oh, some kids got to it. Under UV light, it looks a little bit different. You can see very clearly this UV marking. So I put the highlighter on the key, I go away, and I wait for someone to enter the combination. I come back again later that day, maybe the next day, with my UV flashlight and discover that that highlighter has been tracked from the number one to the number two key. Okay. I wipe off the keypad, put the highlighter on again, this time on the number two key, and come back again. This time we can see it's been tracked from the one, from the two key, to the three key, and a little bit to the four key. Okay, clean off the keys, put some on the number three key. Come back again, it's been tracked to the four key. Clean it all off, come back again, put some on the four key, and it hasn't been tracked anywhere. It's just been smudged. This means that this is probably the last key in the combination. But we don't, in fact, know that the combination is 1, 2, 3, 4, because somebody could have pressed 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, and nothing would have been tracked to the 5 key, obviously. So we try 5, and we try 6, and we try 7, 8, and 9, and 0, and nothing happens, not even smudged. We now know that the combination is 1, 2, 3, 4. We don't have to try every permutation of the combination. We can just break this as is, wipe this off with isopropyl alcohol, and there'll be no trace left for anybody to find. Of course, if you're really feeling lazy, this is a hidden camera. This thing is about the size of a quarter. It has a built-in radio transmitter to transmit to your stock or van or whatever it is you're using. Powered from a 9-volt battery, you can hide it pretty much anywhere and watch as they enter the combination. So what's the solution to all this if you're the guy who's in charge of making that, key, that keypad secure? Well, yes. Say it louder. Yes. These are keypads that have LED displays behind <coughs> each key. Every time you enter the combination, the order of the keys changes. It's kind of like Hogwarts. What they do is in addition to putting these LED displays behind each key and changing the combination, they recess those lights, those LED lights, very deep into the keypad. So they're only visible from a narrow, very narrow family of angles, and they're pretty dim anyway. So if you're standing behind the guy, you can't see Jack. Of course, he can still turn around and tell you what number he just entered, which is the fundamental problem, and isn't even solved by very, very high security safe type electronic locks. This is a Moss Hamilton, or actually Kaba Moss X08. These, are, these were at one point used to protect every classified document, or just about every, every classified document in this entire country. Now they use just about the same lock, slightly different model called the X09, but still suffers from the same problem that anyone can give out the combination. However, beyond that, they're pretty much as secure as it gets. They also have an audit trail being electronic. Um, the X08, X09, and the predecessor of the X07 will tell you how many times the lock has been opened and how many times someone has tried to enter the wrong combination. This isn't a terribly sophisticated audit trail as things go. And especially in the ATM field, 
where you need high security and you need to know whether it was the guy that fixes the ATM machine, the guy that loads the ATM machine, the guy that owns the ATM machine, or a third, a fourth burglar that stole the money out of the ATM machine, you need more of an audit trail. So a company called Lagarde came up with the Navigator. This is a web-based safe lock. The idea is that you have the guy who's supposed to open the lock come up with his smartphone. He connects it to the lock, and the smartphone has some software on it, which lets him type in his password, and it connects to the central server, authenticates, and then opens the lock. If the owner leaves a smartphone connected to the safe, powered up, the owner can open the safe remotely. Now, as it turns out, to the best of my knowledge, nobody has ever actually done any research on the Lagarde Navigator, so we don't actually know whether it has any holes. I'll bet it does. And last but not least is the old safe technician's trick of spiking. Basically, you drill a hole or two into the safe, and you stick some probes into that hole. And if you drilled the hole just right, those probes will just hit the solenoid wires that op operate the bolt. You apply 9 volts or 12 volts to those wires, and pop the safe is open. And those holes are probably small enough that you can cover them with epoxy or a little bit of putty, and nobody will ever notice they're there. Next up, now that I've gotten through pretty much all the knowledge-based locks, I'm going to talk about biometrics. This is the stuff of movies. Voice print, face print, fingerprint recognition, hand geometry, retina scan, iris scan, and last but not least, signature recognition. Voice pattern recognition. Basically, you go up, you say, my voice is my password, or whatever, and it authenticates after doing an FFT or somehow creating a voice pattern. Unfortunately, as time goes on, your voice gets different. If you're a teenager, you probably saw this happen. If you were a teenager once, you probably saw this happen very quickly. As you get really old, it really changes. If you get really stressed, if you're dealing with 30,000 things and you're under a tight deadline, your voice is going to sound very different and very tense, very much more tense than if you're getting a massage. If you get sick, if your sinuses are stuffed up, again, this might cause a, false re a very high false reject rate. But more importantly, from our perspective, any doofus can hide a tape recorder next to the voice print microphone and play it back when he wants to get in the building. He can also record you from a distance with a shotgun microphone or parabolic microphone, edit everything together on his computer, and get into the building. These, that's why these systems aren't used very widely. One system that is used a bit more widely is face recognition. And this thing just screwed up. Cool. Now, the traditional attack for face recognition was to hold up a photograph. You go, to, you go up to the guy on the street, you take his picture, he's like stupid tourists. He doesn't know that you're not a tourist, you're the guy who's going to come up to the door after hours, hold up his picture, or go, go over to his workstation, hold up the picture to his webcam, and log in to, to his workstation under his credentials. This is why facial recognition manufacturers introduced live checks, basically looking for subtle movements of the head, you know, little facial expressions, things that the face is always doing, but that a photograph can't replicate for obvious reasons. Some security researchers figured out that all you have to do is videotape the guy on the street, stupid tourists again, and hold up the video on your laptop screen. You know, of course, some of you are probably thinking to yourself, but wait, I read Slashdot this morning, and there's a company talking about doing this with ATMs, and they're using 3D facial recognition, right? The thing is, this, this company, actually these researchers that are talking about doing this, are using a 3D digitizer.